Ed, that's very interesting. You know, I, I, I'm not familiar. Um, if, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Rappaport's work. He's been writing about a lot of this stuff, and he says something uh, in, a, in another vein of thought, and the idea that they're not doing what they're supposed to, that they'll ultimately be able to show to some degree that there is a certain amount of it, but not be able to tell whether or not there's enough of it to suggest that someone is infected, as well as the discussion that people, many people have mentioned Koch's postulates and the same idea that they're not fulfilling that part of the scientific you know, standards, ultimately. So there's a lot of things we can see here that they're just not doing the way that they're supposed to, which I think is very suspicious to start off to, in general. But before I get to some other questions, so on what you're saying, which is really fascinating, are you saying that in a in general sense that there, this is not a virus or that there is that viruses don't exist because I'm really interested in that because I see a lot of really educated, well-researched people out there suggesting that we just don't understand what viruses are in general. So is that where that is essentially? Yeah, well, um, I think one is important to separate out what is the proof of the existence of the virus versus how they do the testing. Because what you were mentioning about John Rappaport's comment has to do with the testing. And that assumes that they've already have a virus. And then they can, you know, say, well, how much of it is in your body? Is it enough that to tell us that there's active disease or not? But that's not really very important if there's never been a virus uh, proven to exist in the first place. So I've looked back uh, to many papers of prior coronaviruses, and I've looked back at many other papers claiming to isolate other viruses. And you know, it's important to mention that Koch's postulates, right, which uh, was put forth by the germ theory scientists, so basically the same scientists that are doing this research, they came up with the rules. And what they found was that once they, Koch's postulates existed before they ever saw something that they called a virus under the microscope, because electron microscopes weren't invented until the late 20s, and then it was until the 30s that they saw these particles that they called viruses. And what they realized is that they were unable to satisfy Koch's postulates for any virus. So this uh, prominent virologist named uh, Thomas Rivers um, wrote a paper in 1937 basically saying, we can't really do this successfully, so here's a shortcut, and, and made the criteria easier, easier and that's uh, sometimes called the Rivers criteria. And in a paper in 2003 um, for the SARS-CoV-1 virus, which is supposedly related to the current uh, virus as, as an ancestor of sorts, and they say that that was responsible for the SARS outbreak in 2003, which I think only killed 800 people, um, they claimed that they satisfied Koch's postulates in that paper in 2003 for the SARS-CoV-1 virus. And then it's funny because they used the word Koch's postulates in the title, but then right in the article, they said that they use Rivers criteria, which is not the same. Um, and they also misinterpreted Rivers criteria, uh, saying that it had six components when it actually didn't have that many. And then th they claimed to prove it uh, by referencing other articles and saying that they did experiments themselves to prove uh, four, five, and six criteria. But when I scrutinized that, I found that actually they didn't really prove one criteria. Um, definitively out of the six. Um, and the most important one is been universally proposed in every rule that I've seen, which is that you have to isolate the virus uh, from the sick person. And that's, I've not seen that be done for any virus that I've looked at. And I've been in touch with several other researchers who have been looking at this. I mean, many others, um, including some virologists and other MDs, and they also have not found any evidence for any virus being proven to exist. And even the German Supreme Court ruled on this because one of those virologists, uh, Dr. Stefan Lanka from Germany, he put out a challenge that if anyone can prove that the measles virus exists, <clears throat> that he would pay $100,000. And somebody, I mean, several people challenged him, but of course they didn't meet his criteria, which were not impossible to meet. They were very reasonable. So. Uh, what happened is someone sued him because they thought they met the criteria and didn't believe his rejection and and it actually went up to the german supreme court and so the german supreme court had to get experts from the robert koch institute which is quite ironic because that's like their cdc uh, in germany and it's named after robert koch who is given credit for uh, putting these rules out in the first place. So they had to have scientists from there basically testify in the court that they didn't satisfy the rules of proving the existence of measles. So the German Supreme Court ruled that measles does not exist. 